who are listening to this, they think everything is normal and peaceful just beforehand. We're really ready to go to Colossians chapter 2, but to do that, we need to just uh, reread uh, Colossians 1, verse 25 through 28. We need to rehearse in our minds what that says because... Um, Paul, in chapter 2, is going to firmly address that uh, and particularly address it in relationship to others who are preaching something other than, not something other than Christ, but something other than Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, so that's important to understand because you know that the chapters were put in. This is just a few writing down uh, from that as we move into chapter 2. So let's rehearse this, uh, ver starting with verse 25 to the end of the chapter. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you. Okay, so this sounds like Paul knows this is going to be preserved and sent out to all nations and people for all generations, but he doesn't know that. He's literally writing to the Colossians, and as we'll see in the next chapter, uh, the Laodiceans. <clears throat> and he is saying what, he's saying, what I am about to share with you <clears throat> is for you. Now, why would he say that? He would say that <clears throat> because it is a specific thing, not just a doctrinal thing that he's setting forward, because Paul did not set forth doctrinal things. He set forth Christ, and we made doctrines out of it. But, um, uh, but addressing a specific situation going on in, in Colosso and in Laodicea in relationship to, uh, and some of you know, who, who is the main group that he's dealing with? We know in Galatia it, it was the Judaizers. In Colossians it's the Gnostics, right. And uh, they, they had really bad sinus problems. That's what it sounds like to me, Gnostic. What is that? Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> just blow your nose real hard. No. <clears throat> anyway, so, um, so he's having to deal with this, and the Gnostics were really heavy into deep teaching, and they prided themselves in it, and they thought they were special people because they pursued deep knowledge. Now, folks, that could make us that. If, if, if our heart isn't to gain Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when I say Christ in you, I'm not talking about it, salvation. I'm talking about what he says, the way he declares it here in the first chapter. <clears throat> so, um, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. So one key word here that we're going to see in the next chapter is mystery. All right. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay? And so there he states the mystery. There he states what he feels that God has specifically had him, because he'll say in the next chapter that he's never seen them face to face at this point, okay? He will, but he hasn't at this point. Um, and uh, he will state specifically, as I said, that this is, I'm, I am communicating something to you to, as it were, offset your understanding that deep knowledge and great mysteries is what it's about because it's not it's about Christ and it's not just about Christ but it's about Christ in you all right so in the next uh, two verses 
what he begins to do is set forth, uh, the next verse, he begins to set forth what he preaches, which is this. He, he says, he calls it a whom, and he's referring back to Christ in you, the hope of glory, that there is a hope. See, they're born again, the Colossians, that's a church, it's a church. So he's not wanting, I want you to get Christ in you because they already have him in them. Because everybody who gets born again that says, Lord, come into my heart, and da 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 da, he does that. But <clears throat> he's addressing um, what he'll hit in verse 29. But right now he's saying, this is, this is what I preach. This is what I preach. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, okay, um, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, he's using a couple of words there that the Gnostics would use, wisdom, all in all wisdom and perfect, um, which is the word mature. Um, and that, but he is, notice that he's not, and he won't in the second chapter, he is not emphasizing wisdom, he's actually placing it as one of the riches and everything that's in Christ. Um, and teaching them in all wisdom that he may present everyone perfect in Christ. Not teaching them in all wisdom that they too might have this glorious secret Illuminati, whatever wisdom that you, that they're gonna gain um, and be deep and, and, and smart and spiritual and all this kind of stuff. He is, he is, uh, vehemently opposed to that approach because it circumvents Christ and it circumvents Christ, seeking Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, So uh, verse 29 then, he gives a practical example of Christ in him um, and he's showing that it's not a teaching, it's something that is meant to work in you. Notice verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. All right. So he's not striving according to his zeal. He's not, which he did, remember, before he came to the Lord. He's not striving according to um, uh, um, uh, his um, efforts or his great uh, commitment level. Uh, he's not striving about, you know, you know I, I just got through going down to the altar and recommitted myself. That's not the kind of striving. He's not committing himself. He's striving according to his working. To, the, to who? He is specifically referring to Christ in him. His hope. And then he says it. <laughs> A striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Okay, now some of you remember Philippians, he did the same thing. He, he, he brings forth Christ in a way that's the living God, the living Christ, not just the teaching of Christ, not just, uh, you know, I don't know how far from Jesus' resurrection this was written, but you don't. You don't ever see Paul going, you know, yeah, you know, I, I was alive during that day. I didn't see it, but, you know, to him, Jesus is the resurrection. He's been resurrected in him and in the body, new body, as it were. So, um, so in verse 29, he is presenting well, verse 28, he's presenting, look, I'm committed to preaching this Christ. And then he's going to address them what they're preaching. And then he says, and here's how Christ in you works. He, he moves in you in your labor, and, and uh, you, you start, the striving that you're doing is not negative striving. It is that which is according to his working. You are being motivated. You are being uh, carried, as it will, were, by life. Life. And, and 
You can't say Jesus gave me life. You have to say Jesus gave me life and he's the life. Because there is no other life that he has to give to you and me. You say, well, eternal life, well, that's, you know, as I've told you before, eternal life is life without beginning and life without end. Well, that's Jesus. If he's given you eternal life, that's Christ. Um, so everlasting life would have a beginning and no end. That's the way it's termed. A, we have a beginning, and if we're born again, we'll have no end. But eternal life is life without beginning and without end. And that, my friends, is Christ, and it's nothing short of his life that we have received. Okay, so every Christian agrees with that, <laughs> pretty much. Say, well, I received Jesus as my life. Okay, what are you doing with him? You know? Does he ever have any influence in you? You know, um, are you striving according to his working? And, and, and may I say, if I was Paul, and may I say, does it work in you mightily? Does he work in you mightily? Does Christ in you work in you mightily because of his working that is pushing you forward? And, and not just pushing you forward, because I guess I say that because um, Philippians, the actual word there is that he energize, he's the energy, energy behind what we do. He's the life of it. He's the life of it. All right. So we can do Christian things or we can have Christ do them. Okay? Simple. Simply said. Paul knows that just to do, you know, things, because that's what he did before. He, he still loves the same God, right? Jehovah is still Jesus and the Father and, you know, he still loves the same God. He still serves the same God, but now he doesn't serve that God in the form of Jesus has come within him and is the, is the power of the service power the power of it not through carnal commandments as it says in Philippians but the power of an endless life we need to let those words sink down in our ears didn't Jesus say that yeah. let these words sink down into your ears when you know because we you know we'll we'll make it a doctrine we'll be um, Gnostics we'll be Colossians we'll We'll uh, know all kind of stuff, and we'll just we can you know we can uh, impress people with the depth that we share and everything. But it's not about depth; it's about Him. And Paul is going to stress that in the second chapter over and over and over again. All right, so let's go to Colossians chapter two. Now remember, this is the next sentence after the last one, which worketh in me mightily. But now he's turning. The reason why they made a new chapter is now he's turning and he is addressing them. And he is, he ha, it's, it's like Paul is saying, okay, here's the truth. Here's the fact. Here's what works in me. Here's what I preach. Now I need to talk to you. Okay. For I would that you knew what great conflict, great conflict. This is... This is huge to him. You know, this is huge to him. This is no light thing that, that they're moving away. Um, let, let's say that they're staying in the scriptures, but they're moving away from Christ. Yes. They're moving away from the word of God, which is Christ. In the beginning was the word. They're moving away from him. That it, they're not becoming unchristian. They're not just believing all this radical, weird stuff. Paul, because he's not, he's just calling that stuff beguiling and enticing to move you away from him. As you'll see when we read the, the chapter here. He's not going, oh, that's some bad teaching. He's saying it's, it's not him. Can we ever see that to such a degree that we, we realize, you know, you know, there's only one thing that we should preach. There's only one thing that should be at work in us. There's only one thing that we should all be embracing, and he's about to even word it just like that in the second verse here. But right now, he's, he is explaining to them 
that I am going through some great conflict with you, let's say, uh, I have for you and them that are at Laodicea. I, you know, I have, you know, not met you face to face for as many as, uh, as have not seen my face in the flesh. So he is really concerned because we say, okay, because their doctrines are off. No, my God, we're so religious because it, they're, they're claiming Christ and it should be Christ and it should be his life. And it should be his glory. You know, not, well, I'm, you know, I'm a good Christian. You know, you know what I do. You know what I mean? Like a little resume that we have of us. Christianity resume. Instead of, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Another one out of Philippians 1.21. And so, um, so then we start siphoning off the glory when, when we do something, but we do it apart from his working that should be mighty in us. We've been taught, be a Christian, be a good Christian. Do Christian things instead of go, know him, be conformed to his image. Let, let, let the, the mightiness of his working in you come forth so that he'll get all the glory. I mean, look at the book of Revelation. They're all around the throne and everything, and they're all going, worthy is the lamb that was slain. They're not going, hey, Bill, you get up there too. You know, or, you know, anybody else. No. We say glory to God. How about all glory to God? All glory. All right. So that's what Paul's doing. He's having a hard time with that because um, he looks at it like this. Jesus didn't just come so you wouldn't go to hell. He, he's, that's, he's thinking that way. He came to live in you, to be in you, to glorify the Father, uh, to him be glory in the church, world without end. Think about those words. To him be glory in us. World without end. And we go, well, glory to God. You know, ever just say that? Anybody ever just say, well, glory to God. You know, were you really giving glory to God? Or is that, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, could you just have said that? Oh, that's pretty cool. Or we go, well, I'm a Christian, so, oh, glory to God. You know, where's the, where's the, connection with his reality with the reality of God's heart with the reality that uh, in when at the very beginning God the Father Son and Holy Spirit because it says let us let us this is Genesis let us make man let us make man in our image he didn't say he didn't say let's let's make somebody and and uh, let's make people you know and let's, let's see what they do, or <laughs> that kind of stuff. You know, this will be a fun experiment, you know. He didn't do that. His focus, his, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because they're, they're working it together, is Christ in you, God's hope of glory also. God's hope for glory in the church. All right, so... He's having a great conflict over this. And he's going to mention Jesus again and again. This is it, but, but him, and this and this, but, but it's him, and this and this, but it's him. And it's, it's disturbing to him that Jesus is not in the picture. That he's only thought of in terms of what he did 2,000 years ago, and back then it was... Two years ago, not, not really, but you know, not that long ago. But what he did back then, instead of what he's doing now, working in us mightily to glorify the Father. Because, see, there, there it is. See, the Son, when he walked this earth, when they asked him, they said, well, you know, uh, they commented on what he said or what his word. He said, the works I do are not my own. They're the Father's. The words I speak, they say, oh, this is a great word. The words I speak are not my own. He, 
he's constantly glorifying the Father. He's living by this. Do you understand that? He's living by this. Jesus was called the branch in the Old Testament. Well, why? We're called branches. Why? Well, we're called branches so that the life of the vine will be on the inside of us and bring forth what God wants without little things popping out of us that are us. <laughs> right? You know, well, my branch has got a lot of Jesus coming out and it's got a lot of me. You know, no. You're cut out of the, of the tree that had that life, your life in it. You're cut out of that tree and you're grafted into him. And by being grafted into him, one life, his, his nature, in us, in us, Christ in you, Christ in you, but not Christ in Adam. <laughs> the old nature, the fallen nature, the one that Jesus died to put to dead, know ye not that as many as us are, were you know, that, we, that the old nature was crucified. Know ye not? Galatia, or, um, Romans 6. So um, when Jesus walked, he is constantly functioning as an example to us. And it says that in many places, that Jesus was an example. But here's what we do. We say, oh, Jesus is the example, so I'm supposed to go around doing miracles. Oh, Jesus is the example, so I'm supposed to, to take care of the poor. Oh, Jesus is the example, so I'm supposed to do that. Wrong. Jesus is the example of life. And it's his life once he's in you. See, but he's not doing, when he's walking, he's not doing that. That's the Father. I'm the example, he's saying. I'm the branch. I'm the branch that you've been waiting for. The, the prophet spoke of me. I, you know, and when it comes to the Father, he's the branch. But when he comes to us, he's the vine. And we're the branch. And we're supposed to function the same way. And he lived as an example of that reality so that we, we would get it. We would see how he is. And see, when Jesus did it, he was always glorifying the Father. Again, the works I do are not my own. They're the Father's. Glory to God. Glory to the Father. You know, right? But if it's us just as Christian, where's the glory to Jesus? We say, well, because of all the good stuff I do. You know, you know I, I know people don't think about this very often, but in the Old Testament, there was only one sacrifice that pleased God, and it was, a, it was basically a slaughtered lamb. And so nothing they did, nothing Israel did was acceptable unless they offered an offering. And that was acceptable. Paul talks about that and says, you know, doing so and so, so that they, what you do is, would be acceptable by Christ Jesus. Because he's the only acceptable one. We're trying to get acceptance based on us. Well, I, I sacrificed, you know, I, I gave money, you know. I mean, y'all know about life in the spirit and my ministry that basically is the only support that I have. You know, I tell people, if you're not if you don't feel this, if you're not part of the spirit of this, if, you're, if you've kind of, you know, just been doing it through rote, you're fired, remember? Some of you know that. I do that. You're fired. Don't come back unless you pray and you feel that God has you. And every year I do that. It's called thinning the herd. Well, the herd's getting pretty thin. But anyway, <laughs> but it's still good. It's still right because I don't want anything but that which flows out of the life of Christ. And I'm willing to lose, but you don't lose with the Lord. You know what I mean? He'll take care of you. But if you're grabbing and going, oh, i got to keep all my contacts, even if they're not into it or they don't care if they're just, you know, used to writing a check every month and going like this or something. You know. 
Anyway, I know you're wanting me to go to verse 2. But I'm going to go to Welch's right now. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and to all riches of the full assurance of understanding. So we would go right there. We'd go, yes. The Gnostics would go, yes. He's wanting us just to come to the, the, the riches of the full assurance of understanding. That's all we need, deep understanding. But Paul didn't, that's, there's not a period after understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God. What's the mystery of God? Christ in you. Christ in you. He's already said that just a few verses up. He wants us to acknowledge the mystery which is Christ in us. He's, in other words, he's wanting us to acknowledge Christ in us as the life and as the way to proceed. And he is not uh, supporting the Gnostics by saying the full assurance uh, um, of understanding. He's saying, oh, I want you to have the full assurance of understanding so that you can, to the acknowledgement of this mystery, so that you can let it be Christ in you. You see that? I wrote, all of these verses go toward the acknowledgement of the mystery. He wants you to acknowledge the reality of Christ in you as your life and as your lifestyle. Okay. And I had to write that because initially I just wrote as your life, but then Christ is not just a life. He lives a certain way. He needs to become our lifestyle. <clears throat> he lives a certain way in us. If we're alive in us, we live a certain way. I did it my way, and you'll burn in hell forever. But anyway, <clears throat> sorry. Didn't mean to, you Frank Sinatra fans. <laughs> I just, I had a, a thing. It wasn't with Frank, it was with Elvis, and boy, I shocked somebody. But anyway, that was years ago. All right. Before that, he says he wants you to have the full assurance of understanding, not so it ends there, but so you will bring it into practical reality so that it becomes um, the living God. You know, and, and I mean, what a beautiful thing to consider the living God not as, yes, Jesus is the living God because... Because he was alive, and then he was not alive, and then he got up. Yay! He got up. He didn't stay down. He's the living God. But he didn't just get up. We're, we're supposed to have him in us. That's where he wants to live. That's where he wants to live. In us. And that's hard for us to fully understand because we always picture him so far away. Yes, he is seated at the right hand of God. But there are, how did Paul word that? Um, Unto all riches. So he's talking about there's riches and he, he deals with that. So does he do that in Ephesians. The riches of Christ, of his nature. Okay, somebody name one of the riches of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Anybody? Mm, raise your hand. Jim? Peace. Yeah, but it's his peace, not just peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Okay, what's another one of the riches? Scott? Long suffering. Yeah. The long, it's the long suffering. He could have said the ability to suffer, but he, he tacked long on the front of it. So that, because why? Why would he say long suffering? Because we're pretty good with short suffering. 
sometimes. It's the long suffering that gets us. <clears throat> so, verse 3 nails it. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All right. So, <clears throat> he's, he's, he's probably not doing this, but I'm going to say it. He's taunting the Gnostic. The wisdom and knowledge, wisdom and knowledge, but it's all in him. It's not given by him. Oh, you need wisdom? Yeah, here. You need some knowledge? Yeah, here. In him is all wisdom and knowledge, and it comes to us not by seeking wisdom and knowledge, but by seeking Christ. Have you ever said, I want, to, I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you. You know, are we saying, I want great knowledge of you so that I feel comfortable with the knowledge I have? Or are we saying, it's you that I want and the riches come with it. In whom are hid all the treasures. In him are hid all the treasures. You know, you're going to have to go to him. Oh, no, I don't want to go to him. I just want to, want to pray to him way up there and have him drop it down to me, you know. But it, it, it uh, exposes our motivations because we, if we think in terms of wisdom and knowledge and, and all the things that the Gnostics thought of, um, without really considering that they're only, because that they're only found in him being the I am of that. He has made unto us wisdom. He has made unto us righteousness. He has made unto us these things. In fact, I put down here somewhere, these things are hid from you in him. He's, you go, well, why is he hiding them? Well, it's not them. It's not subjects. It's him. He's made unto you wisdom. You know, you remember the little story that I told? The, the little boy, his daddy's going to take him to the circus. And they invite the neighbor kid. So they're wa walking along, and the little boy's holding his daddy's hand, and they're looking at all this stuff. And the little neighbor kid pulls out a $10 bill, and he said, uh, my dad gave me $10. And the other kid that has his daddy says, I've got my dad. He doesn't even know how much he's got. It doesn't matter how much he's got. I've got him, and he's going to take care of it. He doesn't have to pull anything out of his pocket. Okay, apply that to us. We don't have to apply anything out of our pockets to try to be what he is. I am, I am, I am, I am your peace, like Jim said. One of the riches of, be, of there is peace, okay? But I am your peace. I'm not your peace giver. All right. So, um, so I wrote, as I read just a second ago, these things are hid from you in him. Why? So you would not seek wisdom, righteousness, or other subjects, but you would seek Christ. All right. How simple does that statement sound, and yet how profound is that? Because if, it's, if that statement is true, then all of our pursuit of understanding Bible subjects is wrong because you cannot get them by seeking Bible subjects. The Jews did that. The Jews... You know, Jesus said to them, John 5, 39, you search the, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Do you not see that that is perfectly Jesus' clarity saying, you're, you're seeking, you're reading the word. Maybe the Gnostics apparently were, and then trying to get the knowledge out of it, the depths. 
You're, you're, you're reading the word, but you're looking for life apart from me. You're looking for subjects apart from me. I am the way. Lord, just show us the way to the Father. I am the way. You know, I've, I've, I've shared that with you before. It's like Philip, I guess it was. Show us the way. You know, it's not like Jesus is saying, take my hand. I'm the way to the Father. Come on, let's go. That's not how you get introduced to the Father. That's not how you get brought in. You get brought in by being in him and him in you. And then you, your life is the answer to everything. Not your knowledge. Not your understanding of the Bible. And Jesus is speaking to the to the Pharisees and the people who know that. And, he, and then he says, right after that, he says, but you will not come to me that you might have life. See, you're going to the scriptures. Well, is it possible to come to him while in the scriptures? Yeah, your heart. Lord, I want you. And And... If you really get the Lord the way he wants him revealed in you, don't you think that all the riches that are him will be yours? Because he's your daddy. You understand what I'm saying with the, the kid at the circus or fair or whatever. You know, I have him. And I've said this before, but I'll say it a million times again. God's not trying to make us omniscient, all-knowing. He... He could care less about us knowing the answer to everything. Every biblical, I know every biblical answer. And Jesus would go, big deal. Do you know me? That's going to be the question. Do you know me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you. <laughs> well, do you know me as, you know, as all things there's neither Greek nor Jew bond nor free male nor female Christ is all and in all he said neither nor he didn't say there's Greek and there's Jew and we all get along he didn't say that he said there's neither Greek nor Jew it's just Christ, and he has to be all, and he needs to be in all of you. But he has to be all in the all that accept him. So you can't imagine how many times I've been to, you know, gatherings of Christians from different denominations and stuff, and somebody invariably stands up and says, oh, this great company of people, we have male and female, we have... You know, Baptists and Methodists, we have black and white, we have, we have all of these things, and God has made us one. Well, the one is Christ, and there's neither any of that. How is it that we get, away, get off reading it without it reading it not the way it's written? For there's Greek and Jew, and we're all one in Christ. Oh, praise God. Woohoo! And he's going, stop dancing around, you know. Because <laughs> where's my son? This is a little work. I just got the you know, the Lord just reached down and he just did this little work and he just made us all just just perfect little people together now because we're Christian. And that's why there's never any problems in churches, you know. <laughs> Because we're all just perfect little, no. Every time there's Greek or Jew or bond or free or male or female, and we're still that, and we're not letting Christ be formed in us from glory to glory, from one glory to the next, then we're going to have all kinds of problems. 
It's, uh, of course. I mean, that's totally understandable. Did you have your hand up? Yes. So I can give the people. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. I don't agree with that. It's everything I've been <laughs> preaching. So, 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 so I guess I do agree with it. Sorry. So, <laughs> it's exactly what I would say. <laughs> Let's uh, look at verse, well, this was my sentence at the end of that, but I'll read that little bit again. These things are hid from you in him. Okay, so, so, so go to the scriptures. You can find out all about righteousness. Okay, I'm going to learn about, and I'm going to learn all about righteousness. The, you know what? The scriptures from where Jeremiah 9 is quoted is in, uh, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, like 26 or something, somewhere right along in there, uh, 29, I think it is. I think it's tw verse 29. You can tell me when you find it. Um, and uh, there, Paul is going through it, and he's saying, you know, it's not to the wise, it's not to this, it's not to that. And we're always trying to become wise. We're trying to gain so that I know, and I, you know, I know that I did. When I went to Bible school and then for some years afterwards, it was like, I'm gonna be a pastor, I know that, so I need to know like every kind of situation that arises so that I'll have just the right answer. Because people are dependent on me, me, <laughs> you know. And, you know, the older I get, the less I know, you know. It's like, I don't know, but I know one thing, Jesus is the answer. You know, that's why the tests around here in the Bible school are so simple. It's either Jesus or the cross. <laughs> Not a lot more to it. I just gave away. Now you're going to make all A's. <laughs> Uh, why? So you would not seek wisdom, righteousness, or other subjects, but Christ. The next few verses, verses will prove this point. So let's look at verse 4 through 6. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. All right, beguile and enticing. This is, Paul is having great conflict with this. He sees emphasizing Bible subjects over the person of Christ as beguiling and enticing. Now, let me make something clear. Um, I have no problem, and I would assume Paul wouldn't either. We'll ask him eventually. I, I have no problem with you searching out righteousness. But if you're just doing it thinking this is this knowledge, I'm going to take it from the Bible and I'm going to put it in here, and then this is what God wants, you'd be wrong. You search it out and then you say in your searching, Lord, show me him who is all righteousness and how that dwells in us. Okay? Because your heart is where? Not, uh, not with the, the, the tribe of Gnostics. It's with one, Christ. It's with him. 
I want to know you. I seek you. My heart cries out to you. You are the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. It, Paul said that, except he started it with another little phrase. What was it? Oh, the depth. Oh, the magnitude of him. The height and the breadth and the length and the depth. Who His ways are past. Who can know him? And the truth is, nobody by searching, it says this in the scriptures, nobody by searching can know him. But you search the scriptures and you say, I want you. I don't want to just know information about you. And if your heart is in the right place, when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent. And you'll understand why all these things say this, because just to hear all of this in a certain sense doesn't make sense because it, go, it, run, it runs contrary to the average way Christians perceive. But don't you think, if, even, if, even if I could never fully explain any of this, don't you think that the Spirit of God could move on our hearts and say, Jesus is more important than the knowledge of the Bible. Yes. Or the Holy Spirit could say, Jesus fills the book. Or he would say, keep pressing on, neither go to the right nor back to the left, but press on towards him. You know, if, if all that is true, then in the end, you, you might only be able to say, well, all these years and all I got out of it was Jesus. Thank God, you know. <laughs> I know, and I've said this before and we'll say it again and again, I know a lot of people have come through here uh, church-wise and particularly Bible school-wise and there have been different motives for people coming, different things. And some of those that have come, their heart, you know, turned to the Lord. It turned from um, becoming an adequate Christian or an above average Christian. I mean, I, Paul was that in the Jewish religion. And this in Galatians, in the Jews' religion. <laughs> Clearly, it wasn't God's. You know, I was out distancing all my brethren. Well, big deal. You're killing me, really, because you're persecuting my body. Why persecutest thou me? See? But Paul is also the same one who said, but when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil will be rent, and you'll see what no man could explain. You'll see what no man can explain. You'll see it for yourself, and, um, and you'll go, you know, like 20 years after the last class you had here, you'll go, amen. <laughs> Reminds me of when we were on Bolivar, and, and um, I pretty much was the main one sharing back then, and uh, we, we invited a guest speaker in, and <clears throat> they shared, and this person shared, and all through his sharing, our group was going, amen, amen, amen. And I was going, I was feeling kind of, why don't they do that for me, you know? And uh, so when he got through, uh, you know, he left. And some of you know Brent Engel, you know? And uh, so, I said, Brent, why don't people amen me like they were doing him? I mean, was he really sharing that much greater or whatever? He said, well, with you, he said, you'll share. And then like three days later, I'll be driving down the road and go, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, I can, I can live with that. <laughs> Uh, I think we will quit. Let's see. I was—I didn't even read four and five, did I? Um, 
I just got to the beguile and enticing words, which I'm going to do that. Excuse me for this. If I do not mark this, I'll have no clue where we're at. I'd like to say I, I would have no clue because I'm a genius and I'm so, much really I'm an idiot and I just won't remember. All right, y'all wanna pray? Yeah. <clears throat> Father, we, we come before you in relationship to your son your beautiful son, the one that you put in us, the one that poured his life out uh, for us and yet still wants to pour his life out through us as his body. We want him, the treasure. We want the, we want the treasure, not for you to um, make it about us. We want the life of the Son to fill us and to quicken us and um, to work in us mightily. We know it's possible because you put it in the Word. And from those scriptures, it just draws our heart to you. We draw nothing of of esteem to ourselves by knowing anything deeper we seek only to know you Jesus in the way that you want to be known in the way that the spirit only the spirit can truly rent the veil can open the veil that we see so we call upon your heart and we ask you not because we're worthy or because we can't want to gain anything except as as Paul said in Philippians that I may gain Christ we ask it in his name amen all right I guess we're going to take a little break and then